for Reverend Sonia and the glimpses of truth that she has for us this morning. Help me welcome Reverend Sonia Davidson. Good morning, good morning everyone. I want to welcome everyone in the sanctuary and those on the World Wide Web and those who are neither but are connecting with us this morning in consciousness because we know God is everywhere evenly and equally present. And I want to thank Reverend Anne for just setting the stage. She's always my partner for many years when we do classes and it's always such a pleasure to have her beautiful consciousness with us. The message this morning is coming through me in response to my challenge, request to the indwelling spirit. What is spirit's highest idea of what <clears throat> needs to be said this morning? And so my topic is, the message lives on. This weekend, I was drawn irresistibly to the championship, the Jamaica Schools Athletic Championships, which was being streamed locally, but visited, I am told, by 123 news, what do you call them, news, yeah, call it stations, right? And uh, news entities, whatever you call them. All over the world, as far away as Saudi Arabia. And I had the pleasure also of hearing that there are 23 countries that have sent people to Jamaica. Scott? Yeah, 23 schools have received people from, no, 23 countries have sent people to Jamaica, children to be taught here academically and to experience this wonderful athletic program that we have, 23 and growing. So when I did listen and watch, I know I was watching something very special, something that transcended what my eyes were seeing, but my heart was being warmed. It really was a feeling that I could not describe, and that's why I know it was transcendental. My emotions ranged the full spectrum some of it I could identify in words, admiration, excitement, suspense, exhilaration, absolute delight. As I watched intently the participation, the intense participation of the young athletes. And they came in all sizes, shapes, and shades, but all had fit light bodies, which as a wellness coach, I was thrilled to see. But as an admirer of the beauty of the human body, I was even more thrilled to experience. But what gave me the most pleasure, however, was when I witnessed how committed each were to their individual performances. Each one was totally prepared. There was no doubt about it. So what happened to me, I became so absorbed in what was happening. I was running every race. I was jumping over every hurdle. I was even doing high jumps, hop sticks, what they call triple jump, hop, step and jump. I did them all, even the ones I didn't do in school. I did hurdling and I did running. But you know, in consciousness, you take on all of this, and it lifts you too. I was attracted by the power of this experience. It was so rich, so wonderful. 
And during all of this, the transcendence took me to experience some touching moments where I could not avoid a tear or two. And it was, I was quite pleased to hear that one of the announcers confessed that he was holding back a tear too. At least two young people, I think class two athletes, when they came up to the mic and they were being interviewed, they asked, when asked how they felt, they said, well, I am so happy because I could not let down my mother. She has done so much for me. And he said, fancy that, in the glory of your moment, you are thinking about those who loved you. And one other said, my coach, I have a special relationship with my coach. Love underlies everything, everything, everything. So when the tears come flowing, the tears are coming from deep within, a place of love. So all of these wonderful feats that we witness, like every significant accomplishment, requires practice, practice, and more practice. Life is a classroom, and we are always in training, all of us, whether we know it or not. We are practicing, and we know that we had better practice what we want to experience. And if we do all the mental gymnastics, we want, but we have to come back to that place where we affirm and speak truth until that practice becomes perfect, spontaneous, and automatic in our minds. So, what does athletics have to do with this Holy Week? Which is known in Christendom, yes, it is known as Holy Week. It represents the last week of the life of the historical personality we know as Jesus, who we have come to know and to love through biblical accounts, and most of us in this country, <coughs> through going to Sunday school and to church. He is, without doubt, in my mind, the most celebrated and publicized ever of the revered religious figures. But who is he, really? As I recall what this legendary human was about to face, according to legend, perhaps with foreknowledge, I can't help but think, imagine, how much preparation would have gone into getting him to his pinnacle experience. Jesus was not born, we are told, the way he left. He was practicing, practicing. Remember, he was missing from the narrations in the Bible for many years, from about 12 to 32 years. So he must have been practicing somewhere, either by himself or with some master teacher. Yes, even so, it was with the master Jesus he was practicing. He would have spent many years of mastership for his glorious ministry, and we have been shown that he spent many days and hours of preparation leading up to that pinnacle experience, which led him to, that, to make that triumphant cry it is finished. It is finished. I done. I did it. I did it. So let me share the thinking of the science of mind as explained by Margaret R. Storz and taken from an official science of mind promotion flyer. So we know a little bit about what we think of Jesus. She says, and she's, she's channeling our teaching. In all of Christianity, there is no more important a single figure than Jesus, the way sure and inspiration from which the Christian religion has sprung. Gladly do we realize the divine nature in Jesus. For when we acknowledge the divine nature of Jesus, we acknowledge our own divinity as well. This divine nature, the Christ, 
means universal sonship of which each is a member. Jesus made that clear in his own way. One of the most profound statements that resonates with me, I should have said, unquote, this is my words now, one of the most profound statements that resonates with me is, whatever I do, you can do likewise, and even greater things can you do, if you believe in me, if you believe and trust my teachings. That's how I see it. The life and teaching of Jesus is rich with numerous examples of his enormous presence and generous, empathic personality. His spiritual prowess as well, in his, as shown in his miracles, and most of all, his teachings. It is meant to guide us to the spiritual power at our disposal. No wonder so many call on his name in the midst of difficulty and relying on his examples for successful living. Others in the midst of the turbulence of, especially often in the midst of, of the turbulence of the especially challenging times, we become so distracted that it seems difficult to think of God as God in us and as us, and to feel that connection. So some people <laughs> even re 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 resort to just where we were before, calling on a God outside. And maybe even some have looked up for a God in an imaginary heaven. So this is why practice, practice is important, because that programming which thinks of a God outside of ourselves, and thinks of a God somewhere up there, up there where we have to replay. I don't say re re erase, I say reprogram. It's times like this that we're going through now. At various periods in history, it has, we have had similar periods, that populations rely on the hope and expectation that a messiah will come to relieve it of perceived suffering and spirit us to a better world or free us from suffering without our involvement. However, our own Bob Marley of Jamaica, quoting our national hero Marcus Garvey, cautions us to emancipate yourself from mental slavery for none but ourselves can free your mind say that with me emancipate yourself from mental slavery for none but yourselves can free your mind the freedom we seek must come from within by individual effort and the beautiful joel goldsmith mystic teacher reverend everything that inspires people motivational speaker, whose book we are, Reverend Anna and I are now teaching, Leave Your Nets, says, to me, the Messiah is that which frees us from ourselves, from a limited sense of self. We are never enslaved by anybody or any condition. Clearly, unquote, clearly he's reminding us that is our belief and expectations that either imprison or free us. It is useless to resort to vain pleas for the answer lies within. Ernest Holmes, I love this is your and Reverend Emma love to say it too. That is our founding minister and Reverend and Dr. Ernest Holmes is a founder of religious science. He likes to say the work is in and upon yourself. So the Christ is our nature. Christ, the Messiah, is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is neither low here nor low there. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So said the one known as Jesus, who was called the Christ because he achieved Christhood. He himself did not make claims to be the Messiah. He reminded us that the Christ is our own nature, the nature of all people. 
Jesus is said to have lived at a time when his hometown was under Roman colonial rule and turbulent times were in the world. Some of us like to think that this is the most turbulent of all. This is play play compared to what it was like then. The conditions were perfect for the renewal of anticipation of a Messiah, a liberator, in the minds of those who were looking for a, a, a Messiah outside of themselves. In our time, yes, there, had been, there has been renewed call for the liberating Messiah to come. And there are many predictions that Jesus soon come for his people and his kingdom, right? The term Messiah, remember, means different things to different people, and everyone is entitled to their meaning and their belief, because each belief is held onto, even for a time, because it warms and is empathic and lifts people. To some modern Jews, though, it means the messianic age. I am assured that at no time in recent modern Jewish history, Judaism, are the Jews looking for a man. They are looking for an age which conforms to the nature of the God presence. So to many others though, remember, looking patiently for the reappearance of Jesus. Some begging and pleading and cajoling for Jesus to hurry up and come and take your world, right? No. To us in youth, our teaching, remember, and I'm going to punctuate this at intervals, so remember that the Christ in us, the presence of God, is the awareness of the Christ within us, is the Messiah. When we are aware of the Christ's presence within us and be present in us, that's the Messiah, the good news, God in man as man. So Jesus dispelled all notion of a separation between mankind and the creator. He said, the Father and I are one, but the Father <coughs> is the one. Of myself, I do nothing. It is the Father within that does the work. You want anything clearer than that? Clear, clear, clear. The kingdom of heaven, he said, is neither here or low there. Low here or low there. The kingdom of heaven is within man. If we can keep that as a chant, wherever we go, whenever our minds seem to stray, and let that be our focal point of how we live our life, the kingdom of heaven is within man. And he gave us a model, as if that was not enough, he gave us a model way to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, remember? Heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is within man. And who is in the kingdom? The Father. That Father, which is the Christ, the spark of Godness, waiting to be recognized, waiting to grow and expand and to consume our consciousness that we no longer speak of ourselves as God and man or even God in man, but God as man. God and I are one. So the father within, when he speaks of our father, it occurs and means all people all people, it occurs in all people. That holiness, that wholeness, the Father, the whole. All that there is, is already within us. Without exception, the completeness of the Creator is within us. All the attributes of the Creator being within us, the creation comes through us as well in our own individual lives. That which is within us is revealed in our outer experience <clears throat> in form to the extent that we realize it. And I must come back to the beautiful 
great mystical teacher, Joel Goldsmith, because he does not mince words. I love him. He says the Messiah, remember, means God with us, the presence of God, the spirit of God, God in us. He continues, let us for a moment accept the fact that it is not a man, but that it is some kind of spiritual impulse, a presence, a power, which appears or acts through man. That is the reason why the Christ cannot be separated from the man, Jesus, the man Jesus, because they became one, because he did the work. He did the work in and upon himself, where that Christ became his established consciousness, that Christ awareness. So we think of Jesus, who became the Christ example. So yes, we hear of Jesus, but many people would like to say, where is the evidence? And despite of every effort of curious academics and determined devotees who were, you know, archaeologists, there has been found no credible physical evidence of the presence of God anywhere on earth. This lack of physical evidence has not in any way affected the 2.9 million Christians and others who claim him as the Messiah. Nor has it frustrated the historians and discouraged the archaeologists. Let me quote a distinguished archaeologist who is currently pursuing his quest to discover evidence. 28 years he's been at it of a personality fitting the description of the biblical Jesus. His name is Mark Chancery, a religious studies professor at Southern Methodist University in the United States. He is a leading authority on Galilean history. And he explains this lack of findings in this way. He says, Jesus wasn't a political leader, so we don't have coins and we don't have boss on, of his name. And even if we, he was a major political um, leader, the Judaism of that day forbid putting people's images on coins. He wasn't, he continues, he wasn't a sufficiently high profile leader to leave behind inscriptions. In his own lifetime, he would have been a marginal figure and he was active only in marginal circles. Yet Jesus appeared on the human landscape at a time when such a person was clearly needed. Someone once said, hidden in the gloomiest outlook is a spark of hope. Imagine this hope as a beam of light. Let it pierce the darkness and shine forth to reinforce your own beliefs. It will turn your hope to certainty and your certainty to unshakable faith. You see why it's fine for people to hold on to that faith until they come into a deeper understanding of the words behind Jesus' teaching. So what if the absence of physical evidence of Jesus having lived is exact, right? What if it is exactly the way the universal order required of the messenger? What if his followers were even more, would have even been more consumed with the person that the most important message would take back seat? Remember the most important message. Jesus, when asked this, referred back to the Old Testament. He said, is it not written in your law? I have said, you are gods. Wow. However, at no time did Jesus forget the source of his power. Remember, the Father and I are one, but the Father is the one. Let us say together, the Father and I are one, but the Father is the one. And the, insurer, the assurance of a creator, which has given of itself to us, 
by giving through us is the ultimate act of love. Giving to us, through us, with the freedom to do what we will with that power, the ultimate act of love. God is love. When we say God is love, it's not just God as daddy affectionate. That too, if that's how it feels in us. But God giving of itself to the human race. Human race. Woman too, right? Giving of itself freely, unconditionally, that we may use the authority that lies within us to create for ourselves a life more abundant. Yes, it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. So, Mr. Joel, again, goes with, there is no way to separate the message from the messenger because they are one. The message, however, is always greater than the messenger. In time, he says, every messenger disappears from visible sight, but the message remains and is carried on by others. If you understand this, you will never be confused or misled into worshiping a man or a woman. You know that the Christ can never dis disappear as, there, as long as there is an individual, meaning the Christ on earth to humanity, as long as there is an individual on earth through whom it may appear. Why not one of us? Why not allow ourselves to be that drop in that ocean of God consciousness which helps to lift the human race? As we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, we too lift others. Yes, Jesus the Master, fear not little, fear not little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. May we flourish and grow and wax strong in the spirit as a child Jesus did and as we are all intended to do. May we receive all the blessings of enlightened minds, remembering the spark of divinity, the Christ within us, all waiting its full emergence that we may indeed fulfill the promise attributed to Jesus the Christ. Whatever I do, you can do likewise, and even greater things can you do, if you believe me. Yes, yes, if we believe. If we take another look at the message of Jesus, get a Bible which has the Jesus' quotes in red, and read them and see how it resonates with what we teach in this church. See how it resonates with you. See how it helps us to take responsibility. So we know that Jesus, yes, did his part. And the man and personality Jesus did his bit. The message has survived, albeit not paid enough attention through thousands of years. And we, though few, who understand that in the message, God in man as man is that which, when sung in the hearts of all people, or a critical mass, when accepted as it has been spoken by Jesus and other masters, but the beautiful thing is the publicity that has been given to Jesus' words, then we know we are well on the way to that age of enlightenment. We are on the way, but we'll give it a spiritual boost. So my sentiments, my hope, my gratitude, my joy are captured in the words of this hymn from our Science of Mind hymnal. Jesus, may all men awaken and believe unto thee. May the truth be not forsaken, thou who lived to make men free. May we nourish 
to fruition the pure seeds that thou hast sown, and responsive to our mission, harvest love more fully grown. Thou hast shown the glory and the majesty of life, shown in parable and story. Love shall overcome all strife. May we more of truth be learning and the Father's inward power while we're thoughtfully discerning the potential of each hour. Now, friends, I would like us to take very much into our hearts that this man who lived and has captured the minds of so many people, a good more than 50 odd percent of the world have heard the word and accepted, heard the word of Jesus and have accepted that this man probably lived. But there are many who have decided that the message is greater than the messenger. Yet within the messenger is the consciousness which animates, vitalizes the message. So we pay homage to the messenger. What a way show, what an example. Memories warm my heart, yes. But when I think of the words that have survived 2,000 years, they warm my heart and bring tears of gratitude to my eye. Yes, what a kumamiyai in the Jamaican parlance. What a kumamiyai, words of love for the personality, but more so words of gratitude for the message. The message lives on. Namaste. Thank you, Reverend Sona. A very reflective message. The spark of godness lies in us. What a beautiful example. Because all of us have come to terms with that message through Reverend Sona, and we thank more than anything else Jesus the way sure, who gave to us that sterling example of how to live. This goes on with us. The spark of godness lies in us, friends. Please remember that. Thank you, Reverend Sonia. <laughs>